Hi, welcome to Culture Determined on Blogging Heads TV. Uh, my guest today is Lauren Euler. Uh, Lauren, could you please introduce yourself? Uh, hi, I'm Lauren Euler, as he said. Uh, I'm a writer, and I just published a novel called Fake Accounts, which came out on February 2nd. Uh, congratulations on the book. I'm holding it up now. It's a great cover. It has, as you can see, kind of like a reflective, uh, cool rainbow kind of thing to it. Yeah, um, I refer to it as my shiny book. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so thanks for coming back on. And uh, I guess the, the, so the last time we talked was about two and a half years ago, and I, I re-listened to that conversation yesterday kind of because the themes of that conversation are, uh, you know, aligned with, with the novel. And so last time you were, on, you were talking about a piece you wrote for The Baffler that was about social media and specifically Twitter and uh, the opening line was something like, why is Twitter so depressing? And so that was 2018. I re-listened to that and I think it was, you know, you were prescient in talking about social media and, yeah, and it seems like a lot of the, yeah, just the themes that you wrote about in that sort of, you know, reflective essay uh, come forth in, in the novel. So what, what are, is it, was that time sort of part of the inspiration for the book or where did you, why did you decide that this was what you wanted yeah. to write about? Yeah, I think I actually had probably just finished writing my like major first, not first draft, but like the, the big draft of the book when we talked probably. Um, and I had just finished it when I wrote that essay, uh, about being addicted to Twitter. Uh, so uh, it would make sense that they are similar. And, and I think, so I wrote the book between the, the beginning of 2017 and the middle of 2018, and it takes place, uh, for the first six months of 2017. Um, and the internet is like, is very present in the novel, though. I think of it as like a real novel. It has a plot and she's like in the world, the, the, the narrator who doesn't have a name, um, is in the world basically. Uh, and I think, you know, over time, the internet has only gotten like weirder and more annoying and more terrible. I don't know if you do you feel that that's oh, true. Oh yeah, de I mean, definitely more terrible. I mean, it's it's yeah, we're, weirder. I guess I would say so too. I mean, things things are once sort of charmingly weird about it. Um, like the yeah. charm has gone out of it, and it's more like grotesquely. Bad. Yeah, and these sometimes, you know, we've all been sort of trapped on the internet for a year now because of the pandemic. And sometimes I'll see people saying like positive things about Twitter. And I'm like, you do not know what you're talking about. <laughs> you need to stop because you are going to get burned so hard by your presence here. And it really makes me mad when people say that they like Twitter because I just think like you don't even know uh, what what is going to happen to you. <laughs> Um, uh, I guess maybe it's useful to say the novel is about a woman who, um, searches through her boyfriend's phone while he's asleep at the beginning of Trump's presidency and finds that he's an anonymous, uh, conspiracy theorist who has like a popular account on Instagram where he posts like conspiracy theory memes. Um, and she decides to break up with him, but before she can, this is a little bit of a spoiler, he dies. Uh, and so she is sort of, um, reeling from this because she's like not that sad that he's dead but she is kind of sad that he's dead she doesn't know how to process it and she also has this sense of like never being able to get closure about who he was um and why he was doing this so she moves to berlin which is where they first met and becomes a sort of like compulsive liar herself and makes up all these uh fake personalities that are sort of banal you know she's not making up these really elaborate lies but but she is sort of testing out a bunch of different personas in berlin when she goes mostly on um Okay, keep it dates. So, uh, the you know, I came up with I came up with this because I was watching just people do really sort of, um, you know, like banal, like kind of pathetic uh, persona building online, right? Like I was I was observing the sort of day to day quotidian like social dynamics of Twitter, uh, and I thought that they had a real corollary to the sort of mean things that people do um offline as well mm -hmm. uh and so the <laughs> and and i think that they still do that but also the tenor has become much more extreme and people have just gotten so much more um bold in the way that they'll lie online and the way that they'll misrepresent themselves and their opinions and other people's opinions and whatever it is that they're talking about in a way that i think is very interesting 
Uh, and sometimes, I mean, I don't know, sometimes I wish that I had made my book like more <laughs> extreme, though, though I think people who are not familiar with the dynamics on Twitter are sort of doubtful that people could act the way that they do in the book. I don't know what your take on this is, but, but I see it as extremely realist. Right, yeah. So, okay, so the you gave away something that maybe is sort of the first twist in the book, mm -hmm. which yeah. is the... So you, you open... Basically, the first scene is the, the, the narrator um, discovering that... Her, looking at her boyfriend's phone surreptitiously, and she's figured out what his uh, passcode is, and... Um, and discover that, yeah, he runs this Instagram account spreading sort of general conspiracy theories. And, and then, um, and then she goes, so she goes down, she decides to go to the, the women's march. So, that, you know, it's, it takes place, you know, <laughs> very early in, uh, 2017. And then she learns after, and then you have a very compelling scene describing, uh, the, the character at the women's march. And then, um, you find, and then the main character finds out that, uh, the boyfriend has died. Um, and this, I, you know, uh, read one or two reviews of the book, but didn't want to get spoiled. So, you know, didn't delve, I haven't uh, delved too deeply into everything else, but it, but, um, you're fine revealing that that happens. Yeah. And okay. So that's interesting. Well, so, I think some reviewers do. And also whenever I write book reviews, I'm always like talking about the very end. So I think it's only fair that I, <laughs> that I talk about what happens in my book, even, you know, okay. So, yeah. um, Although, yeah, so it's interesting. Put spoiler on that. Yeah, so there's the okay. So there might be some spoilers <laughs> to discuss here. Although uh, we'll try to give some warnings if maybe spoiler yeah. swords things late in the novel. But um, yeah, because I think I, I generally do like. I'm not like a, one, a crazy spoiler person. Of course, this is not like you know Avengers Endgame or something where we're yeah. like looking for the big twist. But um, there are some twists and turns. So okay, well, so you were writing it in 2017. Why did so you must have been? Um, why did you decide like you're writing about ex the exact moment? Um, and, and things that are, you know, very, very close living memory. Yeah, I think that I, I, first of all, hated the idea that you couldn't write fiction that sort of deals with very contemporary issues that you couldn't write it like as it was happening now. And there have been some authors that do this. Allie Smith's um, quartet of novels is, is very contemporaneous with, I think they do, it deals with like 2016, 2017. Um, and Olivia Lang has done it as well. But I really wanted to write like something that feels like a novel in the sort of classic traditional sense that like there are characters in the world that are described, there are scenes. We see the character, you know, moving through the world in a, in a way that is described with long paragraphs. And there's a, there's a, a, a narrative arc. Um, so there was this just sort of like contrarian impulse that I had to do it. But also I think that the way to solve that problem, like the resistance to writing about things that are happening as they're happening is that they will change. But if you keep it very close to, I think that if you keep it very close to specific, you know, a, a very specific small time period, then it, it inevitably reads true because it did happen. It becomes historical rather than like contemporaneous. Um, and I also just think that whatever we call contemporary lasts a lot longer than we actually feel like it does as it's happening. Because I think when you're living so much online and you're constantly reading the news and you're sort of watching things change really rapidly, you get the sense that the world is so crazy and, and you can't keep up. But actually the, the things that we talk about, you know, 10 years ago, are not that different actually than the thing from the things that we're talking about now which is quite depressing and I mean also like if you really think about it the things we were talking about in 1975 are <laughs> different from the things we're talking about now so so that's why I did it <laughs> okay so <laughs> in conclusion that's why I did it okay so so time changed the human condition doesn't uh, but um yeah I don't so yeah I mean I, I don't know how many novels have been written that take place during the Trump administration um, mm -hmm. I guess, you know, they're coming out and they will continue to come out, but you know, this is a, like a serious novel that, you know, has some sort of like ripped from the headlines parts to it or comments on things we're all dealing with, you know, social media and Trump. Um, and so you're, it's also, it's a first person narration of, the, as you said, an unnamed, um, main character. And this character seems to have some parallels with you or what I know of you because we don't actually know each other, but I know of you from online <laughs> and essays I've read. And so uh, roughly the same age, um, uh, worked at a kind of, uh, you know, Jezebel or broadly like 
outlet and then, you know, lived in Berlin for a while um, and, is a, and is a writer. And, and in particular, there's a part where you describe the character, the character describes her, um, her avatar or Avi on Twitter. And it's, uh, for, for, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's, it's your current avatar. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. I, so, you know, you're obviously a very thoughtful writer and you thought all this through. Well, so why, why did you, um, you know, this is not a memoir. And mm-hmm. I assume that some of the crazy stuff that happened in this book, you know, are it's purely fictional, but. Oh, yeah. Um, but everything happened. <laughs> <laughs> and there's also a line where you say, well, I, I mean, th- this is not exactly a There's a line towards the end where you say something like, and this is my novel. Um, oh, yeah. And I was, you know, so there's some metafic- metafictional, you know, not games exactly, but you're playing around with stuff and. Lauren Euler, and we talk, the, in the episode we did two and a half years ago, we talked about um, was your Twitter persona and your real life persona, how are they related? And right. was at Lauren Euler, you know, a lowercase, the same thing as Lauren yeah. Euler, the living, breathing person. And so I, I don't know where I'm, exactly I'm going with all this, but how did you conceive of that? Why did you decide to include these parallels to your real life? And are you, should we think of this character as Lauren? Because, you know, in the in my mind's eye, as I was reading it, I couldn't help but picture you walking around, you know, and thinking yeah, these thoughts. Yeah, of course. And I think, well, no, I don't think you should think of it as Lauren. I think you should think of it as a version of Lauren that she she projected into a fictional space, mm-hmm. right? Like, of course it's not me. Of course. And I think, too, the joke of it, or what I hope comes through as the joke of it, Usually in these sorts of auto fictional novels, right? They're they're very kind of quiet. The the stereotype of a, an auto fictional book like by Ben Lerner or Sheila Hetty or something is that it, or even Can Oscar is nothing happens, right? And that okay. they're they're so, sort so of long just passages the, uh, about Can you define auto fiction? Because I, I actually, even as someone who reads books and considers myself intelligent, um oh, yeah. I didn't realize until just a couple months ago that it was not like I thought auto fiction meant like that thing where like you just keep on writing like words and it becomes nonsense. Maybe that's like a term from a hundred years ago or something, but it's, Oh yeah. So um, auto fiction is autobiography. That's automatic writing. Yes. Automatic that writing. That's what about. I assumed yeah. it was short for. So I, I'm stupid, but, um, no. So how, I mean, do, how would you define interesting about, there's something interesting about that conflation though, because I think like when you write this way, it does, it does come a lot easier because you don't have to, you have the character already. Like you don't have to come up with details. And I think that that's why it's very compelling for someone to work in this way, because you don't need to like, worry on make worry about making it realistic or believable because you already have it there right um and it's you and you have to be sort of not precious about your personality or like your image being projected into the world Mm -hmm. um and then then reviewers will inevitably say like oh this character is a huge bitch therefore lauren oiler is a huge bitch um (laughs) uh and you know whatever they say that uh but but they're not right (laughs) And, and and i think that that is an example of like falling for a very easy track. Um, so, okay. So, that, so, 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 sorry, so keep, keep, keep on going. Keep on what going. is auto fiction? Auto fiction is, uh, an, any kind of fiction or novel that creates, um, an explicit conflation between the name on the cover. So the author and the, the a character and the, uh, ideally the main character, usually, uh, uh first person narrator not always um but you know and it has you can you can define it various ways if you're a critic you can say this is what i think you know just as you could say this is what i think feminism is and you you might be very wrong or you might be like provocatively correct right you can say this is what i think kind of fiction is uh so um that's what it is. What's, so would uh, someone like uh, like Philip Roth be considered autofiction or a precursor to autofiction? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think the 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 real sort of like group to look at are like French authors starting in the seventies. Like French people love doing this. Um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, I think you can say Philip Roth does it too. He's doing metafiction as well. But it's very interesting that people don't talk about him in this context because I haven't read that much. I've read like maybe four Philip Roth novels. And, and I think it's because sometimes he writes more sort of traditional or autobiographical fiction. Um, but of course he's using his authorial persona and particularly what we would call his authorial brand now, right? Like his um, public image in his work uh, and having fun with it. Right. Um, so I think of, it's particularly, I think it's particularly popular now and people like sort of reach for it 
now because we're really used to thinking about public figures in this way when we see them online, right? Because we all understand in the same way that we all sort of understood that reality TV wasn't really real. Like we all understand that everyone on Twitter is like, mis is, is not fully representing themselves in some way, right? And we're often reading them like characters in a novel, I think. Uh, so you you hear people talk about the main character of Twitter and you don't want to be the main character of Twitter, right? Like Every day doesn't be main character. And yeah, you don't exactly. Want to be it. I think that there's something really natural in the way that <laughs> that we read social media. So I wanted to play with that basically and like use my own thing. And and I understood too that because you know I am around, I guess online. <laughs> there are some people who would like have an idea about me because of who of me, my being around for so long. And I didn't want to like make, that's not the point of the book. And I think that you can read the book without caring who I am. And I would encourage people to not care, care who I am. <laughs> but but um, if you do, there are like fun little jokes, right, for, for you to enjoy. Okay, basically. so something like the Twitter oh. avatar, the description of yeah. Twitter avatar. Yeah, would be something totally. Like that. Yeah. Um, and I think too, like obvious, I think something that you realize when you're writing a novel and is that's really fun is that you can like have an impulsive thought, like a really, like in my case, you can have just a sort of like mean or like overly emotional thought or something. And if you were writing nonfiction, you would need to parse it and think it through. I mean, a lot of writers don't think it through, but like I would, I would, you know, come up with a, <laughs> a, a qualified, accurate way to say whatever I'm thinking if I'm writing nonfiction if you're giving your thought to a character you can just it just contributes to their characterization right especially if you're you're seeing the world through through their eyes and you're sort of like in their consciousness as people will say um so a good example of this is there's like a joke where she's at her office which is a sort of like I think of it as an amalgamation of vice just like gawker box like every single one of these websites that's all exactly the same um and she's talking about how she's the only you know she's the only person in the office who knew how to use a semicolon and <laughs> like if i were going to talk about vice i would say a lot of people who work there don't know basic grammar rules i would not say nobody knows basic grammar rules right because uh -huh. that's not true that's mean but because it's a fictional character, <laughs> she can just say that, right? right. Um, and you and you publish a piece in the in the Times Magazine just a week ago, I think, about the semicolon, which we'll link yeah. to, which was a, a, a entertaining piece. Thank you. And also, <laughs> I, thought, I was I thought I was very happy that everyone felt that it was it was nice. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm I'm a, I'm a semicolon fan as well, and yeah, you, you uh, people, you know, often. Um, don't use it correctly. Um, so just, I, I didn't even think of this until I brought up Roth, but have you read uh, Operation Shylock? That, I have not read that one. Okay, so that that is in some way, there's some parallels to that in, in your novel, and just in brief, it's supposedly, it's called something like Operation Shylock and a Confession or something, and so it, it, mm -hmm. he sets it up saying like, like, okay, I've written all these books with various, like, versions of myself, but this is what actually, this one actually happened. And right. then all these absurd things happen where there's, like, another guy pretending to be him in Israel, encouraging a reverse diaspora of all the Israeli, uh, Ashkenazi Israeli Jews returning to the countries of their uh, original origin, and, and all these crazy things are happening. Uh, so it's very metafictional, and he's, like, recruited to be a CIA spy, and so it, it's, it's all made up, but he plays this <laughs> one straight, and he's very much playing with the, just his public persona and a bunch of, you know, as this guy who wrote, um, you know, outrageous popular novels and everyone thinks he's like a sex pervert and stuff, but you know, he's kind of like more or less a mild mannered person, et cetera. So, um, right. yeah. So, okay. This is, so that, and that book came out in the late eighties, I think. So this has been going on for a while, but, but I mean, are you just, are you doing interviews where someone says, so what was it like when your boyfriend died? No one has asked me. I think nobody thinks that my boyfriend died, right? Okay. Uh, which, which you, people though have asked me, and in quite so quite surprising uh, context, like, are you your narrator? Um, like thing, you know, things like that. And I think also sort of read the book as if it's. Um, Every, as if everything she's saying is like my essential belief, right? And I think that that 
is not what novels are for, for <laughs> call me crazy. Um, <laughs> uh, that's just not, you know, I think that the, the, you have to read it like a whole, like as a, as a whole thing you have to. And so, and I think that Roth does make that assertion as well. Right. Like he's by saying, this is really me. Now I understand that you have thought it was me at various points, but now I'm really telling you the truth. And then he goes on, a, 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 you know, obviously fictional, rampage <laughs> yeah and i i i'm recalling at some point so portrait's complaint was this huge sensation when it was published and uh if you haven't read it a lot of it is about masturbation and I, he was like interviewed i think this i think this happened you see not on like johnny carson but he was on some tv show and the host is like i don't know whether i should shake your hand um you know implying that he had just been jerking off or something backstage and so right. so like the, the conflation between when you're right in a somewhat autobiographical vein even though it was pretty clear that Portnoy was like outrageously over the top kind of thing. Yeah. And this doesn't go that crazy. Um, okay. So how did you, um, so one way that someone can incorporate um, sort of like modern information technology into a novel is like, there'll be little like set off parts where it's like a, um, like a, a, a typewriter kind of font, like courier new or something. And we'll see mm -hmm. the emails and we'll see like the, you know, um, maybe there'll be some underlying parts that are meant to be links and stuff or like tweets and stuff. And so you didn't do that. Um, it's basically all, you know, paragraphs uh, and some with some some dialogue. Um, mm -hmm. Did you think about, you know, that going in that direction or why did you not go in that direction? I very thank you for noticing. I very specifically did not go in that direction. I think um, one, because it's just much harder, I think, to maintain um like a pleasurable and also believable style or tone when you're inserting sort of text messages or emails, um, you have to really like get it right. And I think it's quite, it, it often is deflating. Um, but also I wanted the book to be like the narrator is really telling you the story herself. And you, I wanted you to feel like she's really speaking to you. Not that you're like in her head necessarily, but you're in, you're like in her space. And so I didn't, I wanted it to be sort of like, you have to trust that that's what it says from her. And increasingly, obviously she's not necessarily reliable. I think she is in some ways, but in other ways not. So you have to really like keep listening to her. And in order to get other people's views, you have to, you have to basically, she, you're, it's mediated by her. Mm -hmm. um, so that's more or less why I did it. I think Okay. And also, I hate the font. The font. Yeah, playing with fonts. I mean, I guess that that's that's an old trick at this point. And there were probably even like you know Michael Crichton novels or something that had you know like emails um, typed out in court. Courier new. Um, so one thing I've only had a couple of people who I'm talking about their novels on this program, but one thing I'm interested in generally is uh, names of characters and how you decide that. So your main character yeah. doesn't have a name. So yeah. why did you decide that? And then the other character. So Felix, the boyfriend. Um, I'm interested in how you decide that. And then this. A couple other named characters, did that have, there's a Nell, there's a, a Frida, I think. Um, oh, yeah. Did you, how did you decide on these names? But especially why did you decide not to name the main characters? Okay, why did I decide not to name the main character? Well, I think first, it's obviously like playing with this idea that it's me and, and you're never going to like, you're never going to get the satisfaction of having her name be, her name be Lauren, even though I know that that's what you want. Um, <laughs> so I'm not doing that. I'm not allowing it. Um, also, I just think, quite naturally like it's very it's it's kind of rare that you have to say your own name and even when you see it like obviously now if you're looking at twitter 27 times a day as i am you're seeing you you are seeing your name all the time everywhere but you don't connect with it i think right like it's very rare that i at least feel at one with my with, with my name um so I wanted to sort of like de-emphasize that as something that's very important uh, by not naming her. And then I think too, I, there's a thing at the beginning where she's look, she's snooping through her, Felix, her boyfriend's phone, and she looks at his texts with her in reverse, right? So like if you have an iPhone, your texts are usually blue and right. the, the person you're talking to, they're gray. And so she sees her text gray and like sees her name and she's like has this dissociative experience where she's like I know that I talked to him earlier but I just feel like any other person in the world <laughs> so I think that by not naming her it also sort of emphasizes that experience mm -hmm. um 
as for the other characters, yeah, I mean, I think it's very hard to name, it's very hard to name people in a sort of accurate way. I think Felix is a great name. Um, uh, so Felix it, means happy in, in Latin, right? Uh, sure. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> sure. I mean, I could I could be wrong about that, but um, uh, yeah, I think maybe I don't know. I didn't I didn't think. I mean, it just is sort of like a lot of the characters are part of this like post middle class bourgeois creative like uh global this is a lot of a lot of descriptors right but like it there i think of them as the sort of uh international millennial creative precariat <laughs> so mm-hmm. they they all like are on the internet they all like have are very sort of with it um and they often you know travel a lot and and she meets Felix in Berlin he's a pump curl tour guide at the time he's an artist she's a writer she's a blogger um so and he it turns out he's from LA and has sort of like um creative parents uh so he that's that's what kind of name that you know that is right like it's a good solid like respectable name but still kind of interesting uh and Nell similarly I think it's a kind of um it, it's sort of old fashioned, but now has enjoyed a, a resurgence among this sort of class, right? Do you do you think? That well, I mean, Nell made me think of Little Nell from Dickens, and okay. and there's also that movie Nell that came out in the oh, early nineties. Yeah, the, the movie Nell, I think, has nothing to do with it, right? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Those are the two Nells that came came to my mind. But it's obviously like a nickname for something. I don't know. No, I think Chanel or something. But um. For, um uh, oh, it's a nickname for... Maybe for Ellen? Maybe for Ellen. In one of those weird like rhyming... Eleanor, uh... Eleanor, Helen, or Ellen. So it could be anything. I think Helen commonly too. Um, but yeah, and I think there are lots of characters too that don't have names, right? Uh, that that she that just sort of pass through. And she often is identifying people that are there for just a little bit by like their national in Berlin. She's always encountering people from various countries. So she's like talking to the Brazilians or talking to like a French project manager or like a Swedish marathon runner or things like this. So she she is sort of presenting them as in a sort of cynical as they appear to her kind of way. Right. Okay. So, um, after Felix is after she learns that Felix has died, she like sort of escapes to Berlin where they first met, but she doesn't know <laughs> any German, and yeah. she kind of impulsively goes there. And so I I know that you did live in Berlin. Um, I think it even says that on the uh, bio and the cover flap that you um, New York in Berlin. So, but I I've never been <laughs> to anywhere in Germany and don't know a ton about the city. Why did so? Why did you decide to? set a large chunk of the novel there and what was it about Berlin that what are the reasons that a writer like you might go to Berlin and then what are the reasons that someone like the character will go to Berlin it seemed to me that it's a place that's very expensive to live and you don't really need to have a job or something (laughs) and so you can just hang out a lot and you also don't really need and I think one of the things that's interesting to me about it as a setting is is that as an expat you don't really need to speak any German at all whatsoever. Uh, You don't really need to like invest in learning anything about German culture where if you were in some, you were in um, a country that is not considered part of the West, you would be much more, there would be a sort of guilt apparatus like around you where you would need to, you know, you would need to be participating and not um, like exploiting in some way. Whereas I think there's this idea that if you go, move to France or move to Italy or move to, to Germany in particular, um, you can just take, right? And that's kind of a feeling. Uh, so, yeah. Wait, so, so just, sorry, this just popped in my head. Did you see the story that went viral a month or two ago of this American woman who was in Bali, who, who went to Bali and was like, oh, Bali is so great for expats. And this woman is, is African-American and also gay. And, and she's like, this is like paradise. And then like within 40 hours, her whole like life had unraveled because this thing went yes. viral. Yes, right. And she was talking about how it was great. And actually, she didn't seem to know that Indonesia, you know, it was something like she didn't seem to know that in Indonesia, it's like illegal to be, it's, they have horrible laws against homosexuality. Is that right? Yeah, so it's something uh, like that, that she was treating it as sort of this post- 
yeah, identity well, like, paradise yeah. where like she could just live her life with her um girlfriend or whatever and everything was perfect and and then people were like you know you're a colonizer and 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 then somehow she got like kicked out of the country or something it was it was something like you like an anecdote like that could have ended up in in your book i feel like oh for sure i mean so the i'm just i don't want to be saying things about indonesian lgbt rights that i don't know about so i'm just looking at the wikipedia because i'm not um yeah they're not okay so you can't get married basically you have no legal protections and okay so it's not criminalized though okay um and the woman had like it, written an ebook or something so she had this viral thread either that was originated on instagram or twitter about yeah. how great bali was and everyone should just come to bali and you know it's the greatest thing ever for especially because it's like yeah there's no anti-black racism in bali she claimed right. and yeah and she, then she was like and i have this ebook that'll like teach you how to you know, come come to Bali as well. And I guess that probably added to people feeling like she was running a, some sort of grift. And Well, she probably was. I mean, I think too, like the, the expat business thing is a, gr- a grift everywhere, right? Like you can, and, and sometimes she's doing, <sighs> Bali is like a resort. It's like a resort tourist town that does not reflect most of in- Indonesia. If I, if I understand correctly, I've never been there, so I don't really know. Um, in Berlin, it's like a, it's just muted, and that you know, there's like a stereotype of like the dumb American abroad, but it's really true. <laughs> it's really, you know, and they have other countries have dumb people that go abroad as well, like Australians. Very lots of dumb, dumb Australians go abroad. Lots of dumb British people go abroad. Like Spanish people, like no one is exempt from being stupid in other countries. But I'm an American, so that's what I'm writing. <laughs> that's what I'm writing about. <laughs> um, uh, so in Berlin, there's this like really tense, like competitive atmosphere among expats if you're there for any amount of time, right? So there's this like, there's like always a contingent of Berlin expats who think that they're the real expats and they're doing it the real way and you are a poser and you don't even speak German. And then there, you know, a new wave will come and it, the same thing happens over and over. And now there's lots of like tech money there and lots of startups and stuff. So it's sort of easier to get one of these temporary jobs and to, to, to have this, it used to be, I think more bo- of a bohemian kind of thing. And, and now you've got this diversity of, uh, bad expats basically where some of them have money and they're bringing sort of tech money uh, that that displaces and gentrifies and makes generally ugly and boring the, the city mm-hmm. um anyway why would someone move there um for all of these reasons <laughs> it's very fun it's very cheap it's and you can uh, drink outside you can drink outside that's very important um you it's it's looks like no other you know it doesn't really look like another city that i know of like you'll see the the combination of like the east and west influences is very sort of ugly in a cool way um it's and and i think now from just a sort of like advertorial perspective you can it's in the middle of europe and the you can travel anywhere from there so that's why people live there. Um, lots of artists live there. And, and there's this like, you know, you can be a part of a global artist community idea if that's appealing to you. Mm-hmm. Um, why the character in the novel moves there <laughs> is like a bit hazy. Uh, I was thinking about like how if you're of this sort of demographic, you don't really have to do anything. Like you have this sort of infinite amount of choices within reason. And you, she, she doesn't really have any reason to be anywhere. She wants to quit her. She quits her job because she has a bit of savings and she doesn't want to stay in New York after Felix dies. And so she's like, I'm going to move to Berlin because I can. And, and, and people are sort of like, why would you do that? You need a, you need to have a reason for something that you're doing. And she's like, well, no, I don't. Um, and I think that's true for very, for many people of this class. Right. Uh, but there is this sort of like psychological thing that she has where she feels competitive with Felix who used to live there as well. And he was this very stereotypical expat who like didn't speak any German at all, even though he lived there for like two years or something. 
like was a pub called tour guide for his work, um, like didn't, didn't go to German bars, like didn't do anything. And so she wants to like beat him at being a Berlin expat in some way. <laughs> <laughs> so there's, so there's enough of a, so in real life, there's enough of an expat and tourist community that someone can live in Berlin and like purely deal with the expats and not have to learn German and then like take them to bars that are popular with expats. And that, that's, oh. That totally. you're living. Hmm. Totally. Yeah. I mean, my German is not very good because I live there for two years, but you don't, you really have to. And also it's important to know that m most Germans speak very good English and they don't want to speak to like someone who is an idiot speaking German to them. And like, it, you know, like first grade, uh, but worse than first grade right. Um, grammar, right? Like they, they want to, they like speaking English generally, actually. They're not like French people. Um, <laughs> and they don't, they don't, they don't have time for it, basically. And I understand, you know, I can understand that. So it's very hard to learn German there. Um, okay, so part of this section is a, um, a, a, there's a kind of a set off about 40 page section in the second half of the novel that is somewhat stylistically different than the rest of the novel. And it may be, and I, I had actually, I guess in the review or two I read, I, I did see some references to this. And so part of it, it made, it made me think a little bit of like a Tumblr or something, mm -hmm. um, because you had sec sections of varying lengths. Part of them were telling the continuing story of the main character, especially as she um, goes on OkCupid and, t and Tinder and goes on a bunch of dates where each one she like invents a new sto backstory and persona to um, to tell the guy and, but then parts of it are sort of things that maybe could be tweets, like they're just a sentence mm -hmm. long. Um, so can you talk about both that section, you know, sort of breaking breaking the previously established, more or less, you know, um, first person narration style, but also the, uh, you know, this idea of her reinventing her, um, her identity every, every night with a different guy? Yes. Well, so she moves to Berlin and then she's like, I don't, why am I here? I don't have any reason to be here. I don't know anyone. I don't speak any German. What am I going to do? Uh, I'm going to set up an OkCupid okay profile and um, make up a bunch of different identities instead, <laughs> instead of doing something productive. So she also gets a job as a babysitter and her job is to walk these twin babies around Berlin um, in the morning and she's listening to a podcast while she's walking the babies around and the pod there's a, it's an author interview on the podcast and the author is like, I write in this fragmented style because it's, um, I was a mother and, uh, I'm a mother and it's hard to get time to write like in long paragraphs. And I think that the fragment is inherently feminine in some way. And the narrator finds this uh, really annoying. <laughs> and so she starts like, the novel shifts into fragments because she's like, you know, maybe I can understand why this is happening if I do it for 40 pages. Right. So it is like a parody, but I think it's, it's at bottom, like she's like, maybe this will work out for me. She starts seeking a structure in her life. She tries on the structure that she finds basically in the wild, like randomly picks up from a podcast. Uh, it doesn't work, but it is um, a very common sort of popular mode for novels and nonfiction today. Uh, if you pick up, I don't know, you probably got a 50% chance of picking up something that's written in fragments. If you go to the bookstore and like, look, look at, look at like a new release table. Uh -huh. um, and I think that it does work. Obviously sometimes I'm not saying it never works, but I think that it's this like knee jerk, like, I'm struggling to figure out a form for my ideas. And so I'm just going to put them in fragments because there's this sort of obvious parallel to the way Tumblr, as you say, and Twitter and Instagram work, right? Like it's all disjointed information mm -hmm. that you can still, I think like we were talking about earlier, you can still read it like a book, right? Like over time I have developed an, an idea of what you are like as a character from your tweets. And that's sort of horrifying, <laughs> but <laughs> at the same time, like we did this to ourselves, right? Like I understand that people who are reading my tweets come up, come up with a, you know, infer a character from that, right? So you can read and they infer a narrative. You can often like tell when someone has broken up with their boyfriend, they will either say it explicitly or implicitly. You can sort of like tell when someone is having like some kind of nervous breakdown, even if they don't say it explicitly, you can just, you can, right. if you pay attention, you can, you can read it. So the fragmented stuff, 
it, it just eliminates the need for you to organize it in any way. Right. Um, and it's quite fun to write because you can just go on forever. You can kind of like dump any material that you have in there. And like, it's, it's the reader's responsibility to figure out how it fits into the book. Mm -hmm. Um, and like, does it relate to your themes? Like, does it, does it, does it have an overall meaning? And if you have just a particularly funny, like quippy joke you want to make, that's a great thing to put in your fragment, (laughs) your fragments. Um, uh, but also when she's going on these okay Cupid dates, she's making up a different personality each time. And she, she comes up with, um, she decides she's going to come up with a different personality based on each one of the 12 signs of the Zodiac. And so she just pretends to be a stereotypical Taurus or whatever each mm-hmm. on each day. And the fragments actually works really well for this kind of like iterative, way that we live now, particularly online, right? Like it's like every day it's the same. It's, it's a slightly different version of the same thing. And so it's just repeated. There's no, there's not a lot of development going on. It's just this horrible kind of cycle. So I think actually the fragments are quite useful in conveying that. Okay. So, so in some ways (laughs) it's, it's, you are both parodying a style that has become prevalent in novels, perhaps for like laziness reasons, but also you think it really does effectively work. Um, yeah, I think in some ways it does work. And I don't, th- you know, I don't think that I'm totally, obviously it's critical of the, of this, of the form, but, but it's not so critical of it that it rejects it entirely. Otherwise she wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't put it in there. Right. Right. Um, and I think that a lot of the book is about sort of like wanting to resist things that it's quite hard to resist and that you ultimately accept and then try to, you try to sort of like make it okay in some kind of way. Does that make sense? Like you're trying, you're yeah. trying to like incorporate the thing that you hate <laughs> into your life because you can't avoid it. Mm-hmm. Um, so speaking of, of, you know, Twitter personas, I think, so in this episode that I mentioned before from late 2018, I think you were you kind of saying like you wanted to get off Twitter and, um, and as someone who has not managed to do that and is probably on more than I was back then, um, you're, you're definitely not on as much as you used to. And, and so thank you uh, for noticing. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I, I think, as I think I said back in this first episode, I was like, Oh, you're an entertaining you know, presence on the site. But of course it, the site itself is inherently bad and like ruins minds and, um, you know, it has all these horrible incentives that makes people act in insane ways. So how do you, like, so I assume you were, in some ways you were on there gathering string or whatever and getting, you know, sort of ideas um, for the book. And are you uh, basically done? I mean, obviously you're in self-promotion mode because you're se- you're selling a book, but um, do you, are you sort of done with social media? Um, and if so, uh, how did you manage to escape its, its grips as oh, someone I mean, who I'm was very online for a while? I'm not done with it at all. I think <laughs> that I have just, it's nice that it seems like I'm not on there all the time. Cause of course I'm on there all the time. Um, particularly now, but, but I try to act in, in a way that I, you know, I try to do unto others. Right. So I'm not doing a lot of subtweeting unless it's about major figures or, or whatever. And I'm not doing like, I don't know. I'm, tr- I'm trying not to like, whenever you tweet, it feels bad, right? Like it doesn't feel good. Like, even if you do something really good and popular, it's kind of disgusting. Um, well, I think what's the point. <laughs> I, I, well, I don't know if I would go that far, but that's interesting. Okay. So, but sorry. Really? Well, I, 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 with, I mean, I think, I, and I said this before in the previous conversation, you know, the Twitter has like reshaped my brain such that I have thoughts that are meant to be tweets. And I, mm-hmm. and I see, I get a, a little stimulus. Like I see a word or something or a phrase or an image. And I think how can, uh, the thought just pops in my head of how this would be a tweet. And right. so that's really fucked up. But um, so once it's there, I feel like I might as well just <laughs> tweet it out because maybe someone will like it and yeah. whatever. And then, but then it, it, the question is like, why if someone likes it or like, or retweets it or like, you know, hits the heart button, what good is this to me? at all. Uh, and the, just the last episode I, I did on uh, this uh, podcast with Phoebe Malsbovi about Twitter and all the way it's bad and how the, the site itself is, um, you know, like gamified in this way to make you feel like you need to always be commenting and interacting with it 
or else you're if you're off of it for 24 hours, you're out of the loop entirely, and you get these little tiny little bits of positive reinforcement from every yes. interaction there, and it, it's all it all sucks. But so I, so I don't feel bad when I it's not like um you know it's not like I just like uh, I'm coming down off of like a bad drug trip or something after I said a tweet. It's just uh um it's just when I step back from it, I'm like oh this whole system is is Ruinous. grotesque. It's terrible. Um, I think the reason I still look at it and then I'm on, I'm on it is that I understand that like it's very it's a thing that lots of people do and it's not going away. It's not going. There's this. All, I always have these fantasies like, oh, one day we'll just go away. It will disappear. Every it will like the site will go down and never come back. <laughs> and the thing about it, right? It's like not Twitter that's doing it. It's people. <laughs> it's the people who are on Twitter and and what people do in this context. Um, and that is what, what keeps me coming back to it and what makes me think it's like interesting to write the, about. The, the floor and, and encourages not, certain behaviors yeah, that course, are mostly and, bad. And, so there was obviously it's, it's, although there are some Russian bots or something that are operating within Twitter, it's mostly right. actual people, but right. they are responding to the incentives that were created mostly unintentionally probably with like by the form and, and the way it works. Yeah. And also I think that if on a sort of smaller scale, right, like if we're not talking about like me, you know, a viral tweet or like a meme or whatever. But if we're talking about how we interact in our sort of like microcosm and our little like clickish space on like whatever you could call like media, left media, literary Twitter, mm-hmm. like it operates just the way I think more or less like a bigger sort of expanded and, and disturbingly sort of overwhelming version of how that social scene works uh without twitter right like it's just another sort of dimension for (laughs) the like meanness and the careerism and the 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 um backbiting and stuff Mm -hmm. for for it can take place there and it's not to say that nothing good ever happens there like it's quite funny sometimes but would i be sad if that humor went away absolutely not um but I think I keep looking at it because it's it, it it's increasingly ap- very apparent that it's important and it sort of affects like the way politicians talk to their constituents, like the way that, you know, when people write articles for The New York Times, the ideas that are in the articles are always like some version of the sort of landscape of opinions that are, exist on Twitter. Right. And, you know, like t- plots on stupid TV shows like are sort of filtered through the internet in some way. Like it's not this siloed like space the way that we would like it to be. Um, yeah, particularly yeah. because like very influential people, like many of the most influential people in the world are on it all the time, are on it just as we are. Yeah. So something I, I brought up in this conversation with, with Phoebe was that, you know, Trump um, getting banned from Twitter was like both good for America, good for Twitter good for me personally and mm-hmm. probably for every American, uh, I think, except for, you know, Trump himself and his family. But um, mm-hmm. I was wondering if, you know, Twitter was always, you know, like Facebook is for normies and Instagram too, mostly Twitter was more for niche weirdos and various like subcultures to have like internal fights and stuff like, you know, left leftist literary media associated types. Um, and now that, but it, the fact that the, the you know GOP nominee and then the president used it as his main communications platform was weird mm-hmm. and but it made the whole thing seem more important than it actually was before or, or should be as this thing that you know only like five to ten percent of the population is actually on and um you know constrains the number of characters in your tweet whereas Facebook you can probably go up to like ten thousand characters or something so now that Trump is gone I I put forward maybe the hope that Twitter will recede in the national consciousness and become more like what it once was, which is the weird niche site for people to make jokes and fight with each other. But it's not like we're all waiting for the next crazy thing from the leader of the free world to come forth. Do do you have any thoughts about that? I think that it's not, I think the idea that like, what, what, like 15, only 15% of Americans are on Twitter or something great that doesn't that doesn't you know how many how many americans are are (laughs) if if the 
what percentage of the most influential Americans are on Twitter is like quite as much larger. And I just think you can't like, I don't know, you can't escape. It's not, it's not going to be this like fent fantasy of we the weird internet where everybody can go hang out. Right. Like nobody wants to, nobody actually wants to hang out. <laughs> That's not what people want to do. So it's not, it's not like they Berlin, kind of be influential and powerful <laughs> and like destroy their enemies. That's what, <laughs> That's what we're like. Okay, so Twitter, so, Twitter is Manhattan, not Berlin. Is, is oh, what yeah. Well, I mean, also, I think something that's interesting about Berlin is that the people there are not on the internet in the same way. Uh, generally speaking, obviously, whenever I'm talking about Berlin, I'm making huge generalizations, um, but but it's just not as much of a thing. Uh, so it's compelling. It's very compelling for that reason. Um, but will it last? I don't. I mean. It just seemed I th I tend to have a pretty cynical view of people and like the way that systems of people <laughs> operate, and I think that like once the poss the possibility is there, someone is going to take it right. So I think in politics we see a lot of liberals sort of having this like we all need to, you all need to do your part to like wear a mask and like do your, the right thing and help us all out or whatever. And you have to, I, I tend to think you have to assume that most people are not going to do their part if they don't have to, right? Like you have to have some kind of like system in place to, to create the outcome that you want. So when you're thinking about Twitter, like yeah, some people will be nice on Twitter and post funny memes and there will be cats and stuff, but like there will always be a population of people who is out for blood. So, <laughs> right. Okay. But I guess just the people that you think, right? Like they're, they're mixed in, right? It's not just like, oh, these horrible guys are the bad parts. And once we root them out, like, no, there's all sorts of bad things that are No, I agree. And I, and I think. Guys. Yeah, I, I think the like I said, the incentives that um, you know, it's like sort of a materialist reading of Twitter. The incentives and that like you know, based on superstructure, or whatever, create the opening for people who, act, to act a certain way and get rewarded for it. And it's not that they like are inherently some horrible person. And if you met them in real life, they're probably more or less normal. But um, the 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 system, you know, rewards this sort of antisocial behavior. Um, but here, I have a question though. Okay. So let's say you meet someone in real life, real life, quote unquote, uh, they're totally nice and normal or whatever. And then you go on their tweets and they're just saying like absolutely deranged, like bitter, mean stuff. And then let's say among the mean things that they say, they say something that is clearly about you who just met them the other day. Does that not feel real to you? Oh like, yeah. I mean, that's <laughs> for sure. Like, like that's real. And, um, as someone who like, you know, uh, uh, re-entered the, the dating world, you know, 18 or so months ago and has like a marginal online presence. I was like, yeah, like any woman is eventually going to like Google my name <laughs> and then like be able to see the stupid things I, I type out all day. Um, so yeah, I, I, I mean, of course the, the, the precip precipitating event in your novel is sort of discovering that someone who the main character thought she knew had this other entire persona or life or something, um, or this, this fake account, um, that, that he was operating and she did, she had like no sense of where this came from or who, like who he really was. Um, so I'm not saying it's not like real. I'm just saying that especially, you know, it makes a lot more sense for people to spend time on Facebook because everyone's on Facebook and their mom and their grandma are on Facebook and the, well, that's the, exactly the why you don't want to be on there. Well, the normal people. You know, the freaks want to be on Twitter. Um, yeah. and so, but a lot of normals, a lot of normies came onto Twitter because they were either pro MAGA or anti MAGA, and they thought, like, this is where I need to be to fight for my cause. I think they're going to drift back towards their hobbies or something else, normal life, uh, now that this sort of insane, extraordinary period of American history has seemingly ended. Um, right. And I think, yeah, it will be more, be more like Twitter is the weird niche site um for weird things that happen and not like the things that happen on there are important because the president spends all his day looking at it and typing his insane thoughts on yeah, what about elon musk well he's not president yet and uh, <laughs> yeah he doesn't have to be pre they don't have to be president to be like you know very powerful and um, thankfully since he was born in south africa he can't be elected president of the, the united states so that's good but yeah so you know maybe musk is 
yeah, I mean, Musk is another strange type of someone who, as far as we know, is super rich, but spends a lot of his time, like, shitposting <laughs> and doing memes online. Yeah. Like a weirdo. But, <laughs> I, but, I mean, no one, you know, we weren't forced to think about Elon Musk every single day of the past four years, whereas we were forced to think about Trump constantly because his, you know, malign personality <laughs> inserted himself into yeah. our lives constantly. So I, I just think, like, the temperature is going to be lowered somewhat and... Yeah, just people who signed up because they thought, like, this is where I need to be to learn about stuff are just mm-hmm. going to fade away and yeah. go back somewhat to their normal lives. And of course. It, yeah. I think that that's true, but I don't think that that means that, like, it isn't very significant. And and to bring it back to fiction, right, like, it is a, it is a setting where people are spending a lot of time and energy, right, like, and doing things with each other in that is you know it's you can think of it as like <laughs> some you like a bar you know like if we did if i wrote a novel about ithaca where i live now um like that's a setting right like it, there are certain constraints and there are certain things that being in ithaca produces or like certain effects um and certain dynamics that exist that exist and that, you know twitter is that way or like your corner of twitter is that way right like mm-hmm my like you know if we were talking about media twitter it's like a very bad town that (laughs) we should move out of um but yeah um yeah so i'm not saying that it's not worthy of study or writing fiction about and certainly like you know there's probably gonna be a lot more novels written about social media and online because writers are attracted to places where people are writing and exchanging ideas and stuff um, and so, and especially over the past year, um, you know, we've been living there much more than, um, than outside of our houses. Um, uh, so one thing I did, so you, um, a lot of your nonfiction writing has been, um, uh, book reviews and mm-hmm. you acquired somewhat of a reputation as someone who wasn't afraid to write a negative book review. And, um, you know, it's funny because I saw multiple sort of profiles of you <laughs> over, over the past couple of months have have sort of you, slotted, slotted you into that. And I, I honestly oh, yeah. never thought of you as like the person who would write the takedown. Like you're not Dale Peck, whatever that guy's name yeah. is. Um, but I guess. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you're not you're not like a hatchet job artist. Um, right. But I guess you are willing to review Gia Tolentino's novel or short uh, short essay collection yeah. um, negatively. And whereas maybe other people. We're not for various reasons. Um, so now that, so I assume you you were thinking about this um, as your book was coming to be reviewed, and I think you've gotten pretty positive reviews overall. But yeah, how do you think about that as someone who's a, who is a, a literary critic, and now you have your your first novel? And yeah, I mean, I think that like I do those reviews when I do them because I feel that like there's a value to the public, you know, the public conversation about literature in particular and about books and about like taking something seriously and taking writers seriously when they are writing a certain kind of book. Right. Like I'm not, I'm, you know, I'm not doing, I'm not writing about YA or I'm not writing about books that serve a different purpose. Right. Like I'm, I'm writing about, um, literary or ostensibly literary figures who are producing work that is like not contributing, you're not contributing anything right in my, in my view. Um, and so I think that when I think about my book, I'm like, well, yeah, of course someone could pan it if they want to do, uh, and that's fair. And I think that that's good. That's like a, evidence of a healthy literary culture. And what I've liked is seeing that like people seem more comfortable discussing it, like kind of openly uh, in a way that I don't really notice with lots of other books. And that's probably because I like, you could say like set myself up for it or whatever. And, and, you know, I, <laughs> am probably like uniquely prepared for bad reviews in a way that other writers might not be. Um, and I, I think I find it quite easy to ignore or like 
accept and move on from criticism because mm-hmm. of that, right? Um, Do you generally read your reviews? Yeah, but I well, happily gotten kind of bored because so, I'm like, I know the book. Is, I know the book. Uh, so I'm like, you know, it's not to say that I don't, I look at all of them, but, but then I, if I don't need, you know, I just don't need to read them anymore because it's not right. interesting, which I think is probably indicative of something healthy about me that I'm like, I don't want to read about my, me and my work. Right. And I assume, you, I mean, <laughs> what, how long ago did you actually finish the book? I finished it in the end of 2018, and then I've done edits over the course of that time. Okay, so does it feel so, does it feel weird that you're re-entering this headspace and talking about work that you produced two and a half years ago? No, I mean it's. I'm happy that it's still very relevant. Like it, the stuff with the Capitol and the stuff with conspiracy theories. When I started, it, QAnon didn't exist. Like, and the book finishes before QAnon even started. Right. So. From that perspective, I'm like very happy. Yeah, yeah. So you're certainly prescient that people will be thinking a lot about right wing conspiracy theories in right. social media. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think that there's a, there are always like things happening in the world that make it interesting. You know, you can talk you can talk about it in a different way or think about it in a different way. And so that's that's very interesting to me. Um, yeah, I'm excited. To, I also have been waiting for it to come out for so long that now I'm like very excited to work, which is a new feeling. Uh, I have not been excited to work in like a long time. So that's good as well. <laughs> you have to get like sick of your stupid like press tour or whatever. Right. Uh, but yeah. Um, <laughs> so I guess, so, you know, obvious question would be like, what's next? But, um, you know, I, I think when you when you first announced that you wrote this, I was like, oh, because I always just thought of you, and like I said, I, don't, I only know your public persona. I always thought of you as a nonfiction writer, essayist, and critic, and then mm-hmm. that you're writing novels. Like, oh, this will be this will be interesting, and especially when it, I learned it dealt with social media. Do you want to continue writing novels? Are you are you interested in will the next book be uh, essays, or, or have you thought about this at all? Or? I, yeah, I mean, I've talked about it a lot. I don't know what the next. I have some ideas, but I love writing novels. I think that it's it's I think in a way anything that you want to do in criticism you can do in a novel uh so from that perspective it's very it's just a different it's just a different way of thinking so I'll keep writing essays obviously um but I also like writing I think I recommend writing novels. <laughs> I recommend writing novels I think I think that they really make a lot of sense particularly now so I I hope that the sort of idea that it's better to write nonfiction goes away because I think that you can say a lot of things in kind of more interesting ways and like get them across better in, in fiction if you, and particularly if you use a narrative. Right. And as a, you know, as a recovering English, English major, I would endorse that. So I I'm actually, I should, oh, they're fun. They're just fun. I don't know. Yeah. I, can, I should have asked this question earlier if I was more organized in this, but are there books that you like thought about, um, when you were writing yours or not copying, but like something, the, a precursor or inspiration or something you were going for a similar, you know, form yeah, or plot I or something? A like lot, a lot. And there's a lot of cont- very contemporary novels in it, um, like mentioned explicitly and also sort of implicitly because you can, it's set at this very specific time and the character, the narrator is like in the media and like reads contemporary fiction and sometimes writes about it. So she, I wanted to create, make her literary references feel realistic. And so like the way that we would talk about a book, right. We, the way we would talk about Ben Lerner, the way we would talk about Elf Bataman, um, things like that. They're, and, and so from that perspective, it's like very much in conversation with those authors. Uh, and then more historically, I think, yeah, I mean, Virginia Woolf is in there. Yeah. You uh, have a doubt. Mrs. Dalway, uh, yeah, reference and then in there, there. there's like, a Dickens is in there too. There's like a little, not to give too much away, but I like, I think the Easter eggs are very fun. Um, <laughs> well, like and, you said, you have Nell, you have the character named Nell in there. Yeah. Uh, and the, 
I don't know. I think a book that I think about a lot and that I read, read while I was doing this is Mating by Norman Rush. Um, have you read, have you heard that? Yo, that was one where I like read the first 15 pages and then put it aside because it was so Wrong. long. But, but I Wrong. see, I see when I saw in your Wrong. acknowledgements that oh one God. of the characters misquotes or paraphrases a line from mating. I was like, Oh, that's the sort of clever shit that I love. And maybe I should return, return to mating, you know, <laughs> 10 years later. Yeah. Well, he, he like plagiarizes it. I think of it. He like steals it. Um, but she, the, that narrator of that book, I think is so great. Mm-hmm. Right. So and, Norman and, Rush is the, is the author yeah, of mating. Yeah. And it's narrated by a female graduate student in Botswana. Who's like sort of unmoored and then falls in love with this, like very charismatic kind of do-gooding swashbuckling like man in, in the dead and like crosses the desert to find him and she's just such a fun narrator uh and interesting and like lively in a way that you don't often see anymore <laughs> right <laughs> although that when did that book came out in the 80s or the 90s i think 1992 i want to okay. say or 1991 or something like that okay so yeah maybe i'll add that one back onto the list um <laughs> of Great. I think I, I, you'll find people on Twitter. We'll talk to you about it. As well, <laughs> well yeah. So, okay. So there's occasionally, uh, as they say, occasionally good things happening on Twitter. Okay. I think we, we've gone a little bit over an hour. Uh, so oh, yes. thank you for your time, Lauren. You know, you've been doing a ton of media. Thank you far, very much. For following having you me. on Twitter. I see all, all the media you've done, but I'm glad you took the time to come on this little yeah, podcast. And um, so there's a book, fake accounts, Lauren Euler, uh, check it out. I, I give it my, um, you know, thumbs up. Um, and so if people, so you are at Lauren Euler um, on, on Twitter and maybe, and so you're still on there. Hopefully not for long. <laughs> still on there for now. And, yeah. and I am uh, A-R-Y-H-C-W and you can see the stupid things that, that I put on there if you so desire, but maybe you'll just, you know, maybe just ignore me and, and you're just like walking around and, um, you know, living your life and, uh, <laughs> you but, don't need it. Yeah, exactly. Don't block yourself with it. <laughs> okay. So thank you, Lauren. Thanks to all of our viewers and listeners. And we'll see you again next time. Thank you.